Thank you, Mrs. Swanson and Soledad. We'll be hearing from them again just a little bit later. Well, it just seems right that uh, we would have the president of Trinity as our featured speaker here tonight because CHA has had such a long relationship almost from the beginning, uh, really from the beginning, with Trinity. You saw on the video Dr. Wayne Grudem, who taught at Trinity for 20 years as one of our founding families. Uh, we've had many spouses and, and folks that have been uh, uh, related to staff members at CHA, attend Trinity or be on staff at Trinity, uh, just like uh, Dr. Danny uh, McGarry is uh, currently. Uh, many of us are Trinity grads that uh, serve at CHA and gotten our theological training at uh, Trinity. Uh, we have a number of kind of reciprocal arrangements with Trinity, including our students in our upper school can get dual credit for courses taken uh, at our school, but get credit through Trinity. And uh, most recently, uh, our juniors and seniors are able to go over to Trinity's campus and um, actually take advantage of uh, college courses while they're still at our school, all part of the partnership that we enjoy with Trinity. Dr. Perrin had a really a powerful conversion experience at uh, John Hopkins University when he was an undergrad a student there, which led him to serve on staff with InterVarsity for several years. Uh, he went on to get his MDiv degree from Covenant Theological Seminary. He did his PhD degree at Marquette University in Milwaukee. Uh, for many years served as a professor of biblical studies at Wheaton College. Uh, more recently became Dean of the Graduate School of Wheaton Graduate School before becoming the 16th President of Trinity International University just this past year in 2019. Dr. Uh, Perrin and his wife Cammie, who we're so glad that she's here tonight as well, uh, parents of, of two boys by the way, have a commitment to Christian education. Cami taught in Christian schools in the elementary uh, uh, grade levels for many, many years. And then more recently, when, uh, they, when he was on staff at, uh, at Wheaton College, living in that area, they started a Christian school in Naperville, which I think you're going to hear a little bit more about, but are very much committed to Christian education. And I just have to say even more personally that as a former Trinity staff person myself of many, many years, uh, a three-time graduate of Trinity, I am just so thankful that God has brought such an exceptional leader, theologian, and teacher to head Trinity International University, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Trinity Graduate School, Trinity Law School, and a number of campuses that they have. And uh, we're so thankful that Dr. Perrin is with us tonight. He is going to be speaking on the subject, why Christian education is the X factor for Generation Z. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nick Perrin. Well, good evening. Oh, it's so good to see you here. And I love the energy. And I love just meeting some of the CHA students, getting a small snippet of the kind of quality education that CHA offers. And many of you he sitting here have been a part of that for months, years. Uh, others of you are coming in from outsiders and checking it out. I know there's all kinds of people in the room. But uh, this has been an enjoyable evening, very enjoyable evening for Cami and myself. And it's my opportunity to share a little bit about how I think that Christian education, the kind of concern that CHA is, really is the X factor, the, the special recipe for going forward, not just for Gen Z, those kids who are age over uh, 10, but also Generation Alpha after that. And then I don't know what we call kids after that, but we'll figure that out. But as I'm thinking about Christian education, it makes me think about Red Sea moments. And I, when I talk about Red Sea moments, I talk about times in your life where you feel like you're backed up against the wall and you're wondering what God is going to do next. Have you ever had a Red Sea moment in your own life? I'll tell you about one Red Sea moment I had, and this was uh, in 2010, and I was the board chair of the Christian school that Hudson mentioned. Cami, my wife, was the head of school. They let us have that little nepotistic relationship for a few years. It was a, it was a deal just to get started. 
And we had, we had started this school just six months earlier, well, 11 months earlier, we decided God is calling us as a team to start from school, a school, and it all sta- started as families huddled together in a living room together. We said, good, let's go for it. We formed a board. Uh, we got a web presence going. Uh, we started hiring teachers, not knowing if we'd been able to pay them at all, and started praying and wondering, could, do we think we'll have 35 students at this K-8 school, maybe 40, and wouldn't you know it, at our first day of school, we had 90 students uh, start with us. And what a great day. The mayor of Naperville was there, and it was just this, this joyous day. And it seems like everything was going well, but here's the way we did it as a board. We decided we knew that going into this Christian school business, that uh, while operational costs were up here somewhere, we couldn't cover that with tuition. There would have to be a big gap. So in our early years of operation anyway, we'd have that gap, but then cover it up, cover it through some kind of campaign. And it was time to campaign, and I had a donor in mind. And I was talking to the donor, and he said, you know what, this is exactly the kind of thing I would give to, but you do have your not-for-profit status, right? And I had to explain to him, yeah, we filed that in June. And then I come back to the board member who was a real workhorse and would just keep tenaciously at this type of issue and said, hey, Lila, how's that not-for-profit status going back in D.C.? And she said, I call like every day. And I've been doing this for, for months. And they just say, it's not ready, it's not ready, it's not ready. Well, now it's December. And the donor says, I'm not giving unless, you know, this, this month unless you have that not-for-profit status because we want the gift to come in at the year. And I'm meeting with the board and we're talking about this. And Lila reports back, I call every day and nothing happens. It's just like this red tape canyon. And, and we, no, we don't know what to do because we saw this donor as kind of the silent phase of a larger campaign and weren't quite sure how it was gonna work from there. So in the midst of the board meeting, I just stopped and said, guys, look, let's just pray. And, 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 you know, because the way we'd done our previous five or six board meetings is you have the prayer at the beginning and the prayer at the end. And I just said, you know, we need to pray about this. This is a big deal. And so we prayed and then went on our, with our meeting. And once you know it, the next morning, I got a call from Lila and she said, you wouldn't believe it. I called DC and they said, we're all set to go. And we got the not-for-profit status that, that, that was a Monday. On the Tuesday, I remember this, I was at a steak and shake. I get a call from the donor, writes this big check of, of six figures on the high end. Uh, the rest of the money all comes nicely into play. God had provided once again. But here's the thing is, you know, I, the reason I call this a Red Sea moment is because it's one of those moments where you wonder what's going to happen next. What would, what would have happened if the money hadn't come through. Well, maybe God would have found another way, and I'm sure he would have. But there's also always an element of risk in these ventures. Whatever God is into, whatever God really cares about, if there's no element of risk, if it's always too easy, then it's probably not from God. God has a way of bringing people, bringing his people right to the cusp again and again, where there just needs to be more resources brought to the table and God has a way of doing that. Now you think back to the story of Moses and you ask yourself, well, you know, what actually motivated Moses to begin with? I mean, was it that cool parking space he's going to get in the desert? Or, you know, maybe there was some other perk that we don't know about. No, I mean, Moses had a vision. He had a vision of what would it be like for God to have a very people unto his own, called out of Egypt, called out of the land of idolatry, to form this new nation. A nation where the truth about God was taught, uh, where faith was modeled, where godliness was uh, embodied, and hope was exercised. In those same four key words, you might find, not just all over the Old Testament, but also in the opening verses of Titus chapter 1. When the people of God gather together, what we do is we constitute a space where truth happens, faith happens, 
godliness is embodied, and hope is exercised. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes when parents come to for Christian education, they come for different reasons. Now, I know this from our time when we were in the Christian education business, from the K, K through 8 business. Now I'm on a different level of Christian education. Sometimes people would come uh, and say, hey, I want to enroll my child in Christian education because, well, I want you to fix my child, you see. And, and, and you know, the, so the parent says, you know, the, my child has this particular sin problem, and that surely this school is going to fix the problem. You know, it reminds me of a, of a time this fall. We had a Trinity event, and our VP of Advancement was there, uh, Carl Johnson, and, and he was at a table, and there's a bowl of these Ch cherry chocolate covered candies. And he said, did you ever try one of these candies? I said, no. She said, well, you got to try one. So I, I picked one up and as I was about to unwrap it and eat it, somebody called me and said, hey, you've got to get in there. You know, this is what's going on. It's, a, it's an event right in the chapel. So without thinking, I was wearing my light gray suit and I just put it in my pocket. You see what's coming. I completely forgot about the big piece of chocolate that was still wrapped in my pocket. Got home, took off my coat, and it was just covered, my fresh suit, my fresh new suit was just covered with this fresh coat of chocolate. And I'm like, oh no, what did I do? So we take it to the dry cleaners and show it to the, Cammie shows it to the dry cleaners and says, what do you think? And she said, I don't think so. But once you know it, after, after uh, taking the dry cleaners, it came back all clean. And you know, sometimes that's the way parents look at Christian education as uh, kind of dry cleaning for kids. But you know, we know it just doesn't work that way, does it? Uh, as great as the teachers are here at CHA, they do not have the power, the Holy Spirit power to transform your child's heart. Some, there's other parents who may be the, the category where it's not to, so much to fix internal sin, but uh, to be a firewall for external sin. Now, there's a case to be made for that, but here's the reality is, you know, the Bible teaches that we're all sinners, and sin is just part of human experience. God is working in us. God is sanctifying us. We have a context for dealing with sin, but sin still happens, and we know that um, if you ever want to go to a place where there's no sin, well, that's called the kingdom of God to come. Yet, nevertheless, God provides places for his people to gather together to talk about sin and to deal with sin with this new power that only he can grant in spaces just like a space that CHA provides. Now, others will come uh, for Christian schooling because they want a foundation for worldly success. What I mean by worldly success is they figure, well, if my kid goes to the right school, then they could go to the top-notch college and get the top-notch job and get the perfect house with the perfect fence and so on and so forth. Now, there's, of course, there's an element of, tr of truth to all that. Uh, in a recent 2015 study by Freeman and Chai, uh, it was reported that those children who go to uh, Christian private Christian education uh, score considerably higher on reading, math, and other subjects on the standardized test. Uh, those children are twice as likely to graduate with a bachelor's degree. And 100% of children who uh, go through Christian education are able to go to the college of their first choice. Uh, that's, that's quite dramatic. That's quite remarkable. But even as, as wonderful as that is, that's not the ultimate reason that we involve ourselves in Christian education. I hope that's not the primary driver for you as parents, for you parents who are here. There's something even more foundational. And that more foundational piece is that CHA provides an opportunity for God's community to be formed in a special way. I think of it as this way. You know, parents, when you're at home, and I know that you're praying for your child or your children, and you're praying most of all that they will follow God, that they'll be conformed to the image of Christ. And I know that when you go to church and, and you worship together as a family, that's what the church community wants for you. 
But here's the problem, is even if the home and the church are lined up, it's almost like two songs, uh, two notes of a song, and then they go to school somewhere else in some other reality, Monday through Friday, and there's a very different song being sung at a very different tune. And that song can outshout a lot of your songs, mom and dad, and a lot of the song that they get for that hour and a half at church on Sunday. And I think what's happening in our culture, I fear what's happening in our culture, is we're shunting our kids off to school, not thinking not, uh, that actually the score of music being played there is so radically different from the score of music being played at home and at church. Well, at the end of the day, which score of music wins? Well, you fill in the blanks. What we need for our children, for the future generation, the future of our churches, is the, the three legs of the stool, the three notes of the chord to come together. Gil mentioned this himself, the family, the church, and education. Think of the Great Commission. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything, all that I have commanded you. Now, it's just not realistic to think that everything that our children need to know, they can get in that morning slot between when we have breakfast on Sunday morning and by the time we come home from lunch. That's just not realistic. In the past, in centuries past, the church was the educational wing. When you think about the history of education, we have to remind ourselves that public education, government education, is a more or less modern invention around since the French Revolution. And since the French Revolution, the state assumed responsibility of educating children. And I think for many of those years, the church stood by and said, okay, we're in, we're in, we're in. But now I think we're at a place where um, we're asking ourselves, is this an experiment that's gone wrong for us? Now, I'm not here to say that if you have your kids in public school uh, or you're a public school teacher that you're in sin. We, uh, Cammie and I, have had our kids in each of those three modes of homeschool, public school, Christian school. But I am here to tell you I think the most compelling case can be made for Christian education. And why is that? Well, let me go back to our the four things that Moses was wondering about. And the first is truth. You know, we want to make sure that our kids are exposed to truth uh, and that this truth becomes uh, what they live and breathe and uh, born out in their lives. I remember one trip I took with my family where we were in Rome and we were going to the Vatican and we were standing in line to go through the halls of the Vatican leading to the Sistine Chapel. And you're waiting in line, waiting in line like you often do in, in, to see those big tourist things in Europe. And just as we're getting closer, the, the, there's big open doors uh, or open and a guard comes along and just unofficially just closes the door, locks them and says, sorry, we're closed. And we're like, what? <laughs> we've, been, we've, been, we've been waiting in line to see the Sistine Chapel. And, well, can I look through the keyhole? You know, and they said, well, sure, you can look that. So, you know, what would what would have been like if you just uh, tried to look in down this hallway to the Sistine Chapel to see the beauty of what was there? And in fact, that's a lot of what goes on in so many schools around the country today, because God's beauty, God's truth, comes together as a unified whole. Truth is a work of art, and you just can't take little bits and pieces, it comes together as a whole. And it seems to me that what so much education does today is isolates the bits and pieces, breaks it up into this, uh, this ugly uh, kind of broken uh, piece. And it's almost like looking at reality through a keyhole where you don't see the whole picture, where you don't see all of reality rooted in Christ. And I'll tell you what happens next after that, is when children start believing that all of reality is not rooted in Christ, then Jesus just becomes a footnote on their whole experience. What you have here is a wonderful gift because you have teachers who not, are not just teaching uh, 
math and biology and music and on the basketball court, but everything they're doing, they're rooting it in the person of Jesus Christ because God is the God of all creation and he's redeeming all creation. There is no two-story life, sacred and secular. It all comes together in Jesus Christ. And we have far too much of the church living to rea a Sunday morning reality and a Monday through Saturday rea reality as if they had nothing to do with each other. And the, one of the key, uh, keys to resolving all this, I believe, is the church, family, and places just like CHA working together to create this new generation. Then there's faith. Faith is, of course, important in coming to Jesus Christ. We wouldn't be here uh, worshiping Jesus apart from the faith that he has given us. But faith is a growing thing. It's an organic thing. And you know what's wonderful is having teachers who exhibit that faith and live that faith uh, in front of your children day in and day out. Uh, if you haven't hit that point already, you will eventually hit it when uh, maybe it's around 11, 12, 13, where your kids start paying less attention to what you do and say and start paying attention to, oh, maybe people about 10 years or 15 years down the road. And because they've heard what you had to say and now they want to hear from some other key people. That's why we've been so grateful for Christian education is because we've been able to uh, put our children in front of teachers who love the Lord and show their faith day in and day out. I, I think, for, exa for example, of somebody who was on our school staff. His name was George. He's since retired, but uh, George in his time was a Navy chaplain. In fact, uh, he taught physics for us, but he was a Navy chaplain back in the day. And in fact, he was in the, the Persian Gulf in the 1980s when the USS Stark was hit by two torpedoes uh, and took out the hull of a boat and something like two dozen um, uh, servicemen were killed and another two, two dozen were badly injured. And he was right there when it happened. He suffered post-traumatic stress disorder as a result, but he was a chaplain as a, on the spot. And he told, tells the stories of how he had been there with servicemen who were dying. And he, though he was under strict orders that he couldn't share his faith with people, he didn't care about that right now. He said, God wants me to share what's going to happen and what they need to know. And these uh, uh, dying servicemen uh, heard the gospel from George again and again and again. Uh, in, the, in the remaining minutes as he moved from serviceman to serviceman. And as he's sharing stories like that, it's, you know, it can't help but impact, knowing that this, isn't, that this faith thing for George is not something made up, it's something he's willing to risk for, it's something he's risked his career for, that he is all in in this gospel venture. And faith is contagious. When we see faith modeled, not just by mom and dad, but by this other team, the kids eventually get the idea. And then, of course, we, we look for communities of godliness. Godliness is not something that can be manufactured. Uh, it has to come from God. Now, I have to say that it seems to me that uh, one of the real challenges of, of being a kid today, of belonging to Gen Z, is what's going on in the educational space. Uh, let me just uh, point to two areas. Uh, one I want to be careful about because it has to do with sex. And I know we've got kids of, of different ages in this room. But it seems to me that one, th one of the tragedies of, of education, as we often have conceived it as a society, is to take on this agenda of allowing our children to be, uh, to be sexualized in a way that's completely out of keeping with God's standards. Uh, and this is true, not just through the sexual education, but kind of the, the atmosphere of, highly charged atmosphere of sexuality. Some of the things that even our kindergartners are being exposed to uh, in terms of uh, orientations or positions or paraphernalia, you won't even believe. And I was just, uh, we were just sitting there at the table uh, hearing the latest from Scott Phelps about legislation coming down the line in Illinois that will make all that look like Mary Poppins. Now here's the thing, friends, is uh, what happens is it's not just a loss of innocence on the part of our children, but there's a message here that says your identity is wrapped up in your ability to 
you know, carry out this, this particular function that we know by God's standards is reserved for marriage. Now that's what I mean by not singing from the same songbook. We, what we're trying to tell our, our children is that, listen, uh, th sex is something very precious, very beautiful, but it's res reserved for marriage. When you keep hearing from your culture something very, very different, well, mom and dad begins to look a little bit out of it, and the church begins to look out of it, and you know the rest. Think about another uh, point, and that is, um, I'm going to talk about bullying. Bullying is a, recognized as an increasing e epidemic in the American educational space. Uh, incidences of bullying have been increasing 2% a year since 2010 when we started that school uh, 10 years ago. And you say, well, how big a, a story is this? Well, let's put it this way. 90% of kids uh, between ages 4th grade and 8th grade report being bullied right now. And we, we just expect that to increase. A, re a recent study that was just re released in 2017 studied almost 8,000 cases, a longitudinal study of bullying from people who were bullied uh, in the UK 30, 40 years ago, and they can actually track that bullying as, when you're bullied as a child, it has lasting emotional, social, economic uh, impact for you on the rest of your life. There's even a de demonstrable connection or proof to say that if you're a victim of bullying, your IQ will go down. Uh, it's a terrible problem. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, what we have to do is, hey, just run away from all this, because there's another part of the story. Godliness only takes place, we know, by the Spirit of God being active. And what CHA, I know, is doing is creating this environment that's committed to holiness and purity and, and, and righteousness. So those kinds of things aren't going to distract your child from what's really important, and that's growing as a young adult. I think the last thing I want to talk about is hope. Hope is something that just seems to be so scarce among so many of our young people. So many among Gen X, uh, not Gen X, Gen Y, and so many among Gen Z. And we know that hope seems so scarce in part because the absolute epidemic of teen suicides these days. It's simply tragic. And if you know the numbers, you know what I mean. Where is hope gone? Well, I think communities just like CHA, communities that you're here to support, are not just the key for your children, uh, but, but for this community and for the nation. So when I think about hope, I, I think about, I think back to the Red Sea. And I want you to ima imagine what would it have been like to have been there. Moses is stretching out his arms. Uh, the, Egypt the Egyptians are right back there. Maybe you could see the, the, the dust being kicked up miles away. And Moses is saying, okay, God, this is all you. And the waters start to part. And we know from scripture that what had happened is that uh, the, the Israelites plundered the Egyptians, so they had a lot of stuff to carry. But we also know that the Israelites were very fruitful, and therefore they had a lot of kids. It was a demographic skew to having just lots and lots of kids. And I have to imagine that as the waters parted, and if you were one of the Israelites looking at the soggy bottom of the Red Sea, and you're wondering, am I really going to cross this? And it's your own Red Sea moment. And then you have to look around at all the kids and maybe what you do is you put down that gold vessel that you got from Egypt and you grab a kid's wrist and your, your son or daughter's wrist and then you see a few kids who are unattended and you say, this is our hope, is crossing this Red Sea because God is in the business of forming this new people, this new exodus. And that moment, of course, will have been deeply shaping for that generation. And of course, when they cross the Red Sea, you know the rest of the story. And God does form that people, a people set apart for his own purposes. But you know what? Here's the thing. God had to call the people out of Egypt in order to form this new people. Why? So that they might be stuck by themselves and have no impact anywhere? No, but in order to go into a new land. 
because the Bible goes on to tell the story of people like Joshua and Caleb who led Israel to, be, to come into this new land to worship the one true God, but then to create, to be part of this people that would impact the world, indeed be the instrument by which God would save the world. Do you realize when you're gathered here tonight, you are part of an event uh, which God will use to save creation? And you also have a decision to make. It's also your Red Sea moment because uh, this is also a time of what's it really worth? How much do I invest in an organization like CHA? And I want you to think with hope. Some of you here, you're just saying, hey, I'm just here for my kid. I want, you, I want to challenge you to broaden your vision. When Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, into the desert, he wasn't just thinking about kids in the neighborhood. He was thinking across the generations. He was thinking about children not yet born and their children and their children after them. The true beauty of the Exodus moment was that people of Israel came together and said, we see that the Egyptians are right over our shoulder and we're not just going to, it's not just about escaping the Egyptians. It's in order to, to come out in order to get our bearings as a people in order to come back to Egypt and then let the gospel have its own way. And that's exactly what I believe what we're doing here is that we are coming together as a people with the church, the family, and great institutions like CHA so that God could have his way in this world not just for the next five years, not just for the next 10 years, uh, but for decades and decades to come. But what we need is people uh, who, at this Red Sea moment who are willing to put down some stuff in order to grab a ch the child's hand who, who otherwise wouldn't be able to come and make it through that Red Sea. My question for you, my challenge for you tonight is are, at this Red Sea moment, are you going to trust God for that? And do you believe with a Moses-like hope that that's how God can use even an event like tonight? Thank you.